Good. All right. We have our regular business meeting for February. We will go ahead and uh, get started here. I'll call the meeting to order with roll call, please. Beth Bailey? Here. Marcus Jorgensen? Here. John Cross? Here. Mary Coons? Here. Maria Mason? Here. Lisa Panzer? Here. Jack Here. 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 Join me in the Pledge of Allegiance, please. The Pledge of Allegiance to, to the, the flag of the United States, States of America. America. And to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. All right, we have minutes from the regular meeting, January 10. I move for approval of the minutes from January 10th. Second. Motion and a second then to approve the minutes from January 10. All in favor, say aye. 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 All those not, same sign. All right. Thank you for those uh, that are with us tonight uh, in the audience as well. Uh, the uh, amount of police presence is not because of an issue or problem. <laughs> They're going to join us a little bit later in the agenda. And uh, thank everybody else for uh, spending their Valentine's evening with the Beaverdam Unified School Board. So thank you for that. <laughs> Open arms. <laughs> Um, we do have two people signed up for public comment, so we will go ahead and I will read this uh, just informational and in recognition of the privacy rights of individuals and employees in the district. The Board of Education prohibits any public comment on individual employees or constituents of the district on all matters in which the employee or constituent may be identified or inferred from the comments. The Board of Education will generally not discuss or take action on non-agenda items brought up by the public at the meeting. So with that, I will go ahead and uh, ask uh, Joe to come on up. Joe, if you want to then state your full name and your reason for public comment, I'd appreciate it. Hi, I'm Joe Bruns. Uh, there's quite a few that I know here, along with the guys sitting over there in the corner so I can't get out of hand. <laughs> but anyhow, uh, I have a lot of different staff members, whether they're teachers or aides or whatever, that work for the school district and been around the school district. And I have had concerns. I've got grandchildren that belong to this school district, and I have a son that's going to be in the high school here next year. And the disturbances that go on in our classrooms, um, starting in the elementary schools all the way up through we got to somewhere along the line it's got to be figured out and it's got to be stopped you know the and i'm not pointing fingers at the staff or the it's it's a twofold deal the children have to respect the teachers the parents have to respect the system and the system also has to demand that that respect and stuff is held through. We have so many times and so many minutes of education time that is lost by disruptive students in the classes. You take 20, uh, 21 students in a room, and if one of them is disruptive for five minutes that the teacher has to take her time away, from that classroom and that teaching, that's over 100 learning minutes that the rest of those students, you know, combined have lost. You know, and it's, it's got to end because as we can see, the proficiency ratings coming out of, you know, the elementary schools going into the middle school is not, as far as I'm concerned, where they need to be. The educational, and I understand, you know, the, we got a, the IEPs. I had a number of foster children that had the IEPs, and I've dealt with those. And I dealt with the behaviors that they possessed in school. But I worked with the teachers and the staff that were there to get that compliance with the students. We are shortchanging a lot of our students' learning times by appeasing to, you know, we got to deal with this disruptive child or whatever. 
there has to be something devised and come up with the school board here that says we're going to have respect in the classrooms these are learning institutions these children are going to learn and you know the parents that don't want to you know demand that their child respects the school the teachers and the learning process those parents then we need to sit the you know the school board and uh, everybody needs to figure out what it is that we can do to either get them on board or figure out a different learning plan for them there is alternatives out there you know and we've done this virtual learning at home and one thing and another and i guess to the parents who don't want to work with the school and don't want to get their children to show the respect and the learning and stuff that goes on we we've tried virtual learning and if these parents think that their child is that wonderful and not then maybe they should homeschool their child through the virtual program like we've had worked here you know somewhere along the way it's got to end because there's a lot of students that are learning are losing on a lot of learning time and it happens in all the buildings and i think if we start at the elementary level and get that it will follow through as the children get older you know if they know they can't get by with it in kindergarten they're not going to get by with it in second grade and if they're not going to get by with it in fifth grade they're not going to carry it to the middle school with them or if they do it is not going to be nearly to the levels as what it is so with that being said i ask you all to take time figure out some time and actually go unannounced and see once some of the behaviors and like one teacher told me this was a couple years ago it was a great day in the middle school today and i said why is that she said well i didn't get cussed at once that's not acceptable behavior mm -hmm. so with that i thank you for listening all right thank you joe next up steve same thing steve you just want to give us your full name and topic of discussion So Steve Rajeski, the uh, Return to Learn program. I know um, last month's meeting, Mark had to make some tough uh, decisions and come up with a plan over Christmas, and then you all had to vote on it. Um, as we look around the world and we see um, countries lifting all restrictions, as we see cities and um, provinces lifting all restrictions. I kind of have the unpopular uh, voice to ask when we're going to do that here, make, um, you know, the, the December announcement by the CDC that the PCR test does not differentiate between the common cold, between the flu virus or COVID-19, the cold virus being a coronavirus. So it doesn't differentiate. So when will we, as a district, um, people that are, you know, vaccinated, um, that wanted to be, I think, are that are boosted are, um, you know, there's a lot going on in our world today. When when will we, as the parents, have a choice? When will the teachers, who were counted on to be sensible, in in handling their own health decisions? of whether they should show up for school or not, when will they be allowed to can go back to making sensible decisions and not be restricted? Um, when, will, when will it be fair now that natural immunity has been recognized as at least as good as vaccination status that kids that aren't vaccinated won't be discriminated against in the school district because currently they are that they're held out of school longer than people that are vaccinated. So I just ask that that tough subject be broached again and um, continue to progress as we see the science, the studies coming out of Johns Hopkins, out of, out of the UK, um, 
you know, we, we start looking at some of those in our discussions and say, okay, we're going to consider more than just, um, you know, what we might hear from one source and take a look across the board and say, when can we end this? When is the risk versus reward for these practices um, more, there's, there's a negative impact because of these. So I just ask that to be revisited. I don't know, Mark, if that was your, uh, or I'm sorry, if that was part of the, part of the, the uh, what was gonna be discussed tonight or not, but I know that last month we took a step that the teachers could return. Um, you know, when can we lift all of those restrictions um, as, a, as a district? As, as I understand, there's no negative consequence to any money that we'd receive for the district for not complying with uh, whatever mandate uh, that there might be out there. So is it something that we can consider um, and do? And the people that, that want to wear masks can still People that want to get vaccinated can still, but there's no discrimination against those who don't. That's what I'm asking for the board to consider. Thank you. All right, thanks, Steve. And I know that is an agenda item for tonight, so we'll get an update on that. All right, that will end public comment, and we will move on to announcements. <coughs> The board may recess into closed session per Wisconsin Statute 19.85, parent 1, parent C, considering employment, promotion, compensation, or performance evaluation data of any public employee over which the governmental body has jurisdiction or exercises responsibility, specifically to discuss specific employees or employee groups, and Wisconsin Statute 19.85, parent 1, parent E, for deliberating or negotiating the purchase of public properties, the investing of public funds, or conducting other specified public business whenever competitive or bargaining reasons require a closed session. The board will reconvene into open session for the possible transaction of business and adjournment. All right, thank you, Bev. That moves us on to an agenda. If there are no corrections, I'll look for an adoption. So moved. Second. Okay, we have a motion and a second then to adopt the agenda. All in favor? Aye. 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 All those not, same sign. All right, we will move on to reports uh, presented by admin. We will start with 9.1, which is our audit report. All right, um, so um, here with us tonight, we have Paul Franz from Baker Tilly, um, where he is a partner. Um, he has been um, a partner with us um, on our audit um, since I've been with the district. So he is going to provide an update on this year's audit. Thank you. Share my screen here. All right. Hoping that you guys. Excuse me, can, can uh, hear and see that okay? Yes, sir. Great. Well, again, thank you for uh, the introduction. Uh, again, my name is Paul France. I work in the Milwaukee office, and uh, uh, as uh, Emory alluded to, I have been involved in the district really actually as a staff in 2005 is my first year when I began uh, working with the, the district and have uh, Played many roles in the audit process, and then I'm happy to be serving as the partner and in, in signing uh, partner for your audit. I'm getting some feedback, so you guys are hearing me okay, right? Yes. yes. Okay. We'll get that done. So I have issued an unmodified opinion, also known as a clean bill of health, and financial report. So in front of you, you should have two two bound documents, mm -hmm. one labeled the financial statement, one labeled the audit result letter. In the financial statement document, you'll find the unmodified opinion. And what that tells you is that all necessary accounting principles have been adopted, that all accounting bits and figures in there are materially correct, and that all necessary disclosures uh, have been included in that document. So at the end of the day, when you hire an external monitor, this is the outcome you're looking here, like an unmodified clinical health. We also issued an audit results letter that summarizes our audit uh, processes, uh, lays out any recommendations that we gave to management during the course of our work, and then has uh, 
and we're in for a minute, some marriage communication. I think we need to have to do this at any time. Nothing uh, the, the unusual just uh, put out in there. Things that we've discussed in years past related to very weaknesses uh, around uh, reporting financial statements in our preparation of the documents for you uh, remains to be included in there. We continue to have a, have a capital asset appraisal uh, recommendation as a management navigate uh, using the internal software to crack that and there are some issues uh, that we're working together on to address. Uh, and then lastly, there's some thought provoking uh, discussion points in there about trends that we're seeing uh, at other districts we're here to uh, uh, just uh, bring uh, the forefront of your mind if it's not already there and I can have a different discussion at another point if there are further discussions. I have provided uh, a screen here. Just a quick look at the financial highlights for the June 30, 2021 audit. We'll start in the general fund column there. Of $42 million in revenue this year of 41.5 million of expenditures. We had an increase in fund balance of $412,000. Uh, bringing your fund balance at the end of the year to just over $5.2 million in the general fund. The biggest piece being the unassigned category about 5.1 million. Uh, and what that tells you, or what that unassigned category tells you is that's the reserves of the general fund. Um, so a very healthy financial position uh, in your general fund. Special education fund, uh, $2 million of revenue and expenses. Uh, don't carry a, a fund balance in there. Debt service fund, uh, this houses the Principal and interest activity for the district. Uh, about $5.4 million of revenue go, goes into that fund. Uh, and then you get principal and interest payments of about $6.4 million. You do have $1.1 million of prescriptive fund balance uh, that can be used to pay down debt in the future. In the last column there, uh, some of your smaller funds we group into a category called non major funds. So this would be your trust fund, your fund 21. Uh, this would be uh, some capital project funds, the food service fund, the community service fund. The collection of all those funds is about $3.2 million of fund balance at year end. So move on to the next page here. Just a quick look at your budgetary compliance. Uh, when you put together your, your general fund fund balance, you had planned to add about $24,000 of fund balance, as I showed on the, the previous page just over $400,000 added to fund balance. So positive year compared to where you had planned to be. <clears throat> and then as we scroll down, a look at your long-term debt as of June 30, 2021, about $50.5 million of general obligation bonds and notes outstanding, down uh, about $4.2 million from the pre previous year, uh, about $671,000 of capital leases, um, and then uh, about $400,000 of vested compensated absences. In between there, you get a, a net OPEB liability and a net pension liability. These liabilities are determined by actuarial uh, studies. Uh, therefore, it's a, a number based on a certain number of events happening in the future. The district, with both of these liabilities, it isn't a pay-as-you-go basis, meaning that when it's time to pay, um, you, you pay, and uh, ultimately there's no repayment schedule, uh, as you find, because of that similar, or unlike uh, a general obligation type debt. Lastly here, we, we do perform a federal and state award single audit, uh, this is because the district receives more than $750,000 of federal funding uh, during the year that they spend. Uh, we, because we're in Wisconsin, anytime you have a federal single audit, we get to do a, a state single audit. So we've uh, tested all necessary major programs under that for compliance uh, as uh, required. And uh, happy to report that there were no identified findings on the related major programs that we have. So with that, that is my short summary on the year. We've received nothing but cooperation from management throughout the process. Anne Marie and Mark and their support team were, were fantastic to work with. Uh, we navigated uh, another remote audit 
and uh, happy uh, happy with the results. So with that, I, I'll pause here. And just talk to you. Whoa. Any questions anybody has regarding the audit report? All right. With that, uh, no questions. So thank you for joining us tonight, and thank you for the report. Thank you all. Thanks a lot, Paul. Thank you. Thanks, Paul. All right, that'll move us on to 9.2, uh, School <laughs> of the Month presentation. I move for what? adoption oh, of sorry. the audit report as presented. Second. <laughs> Thank you, Marge. So we have a motion and a second then to approve the audit report as presented. Uh, all in favor? Aye. 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 All those not, same sign? All right. Now we will move on to 9.2 School of the Month presentation. Washington Elementary. So in the spirit of Valentine's Day, I have some Valentine's Aww. Actually, they're not. They're an invite to the Painted Night that's coming up in another month. So, yeah. Julie Leventhal, who kind of heads it up, um, just wanted to reach out Thank to the you. board members. And yeah. as you know, March 10th, we're having a little Painted Night at Washington. So, you're welcome to attend if, you're, if you want. So, that was not my idea. Okay, so the bulk of tonight will be really focused on um, our school success plan at Washington Elementary. For those that do not do not know me, my name is Paul Wilson. I've been here principal at Washington just one year ago. And I was at uh, Wilson at South Beaver Dam, I think, the last four years, and then also an AP at the high school. So the three objectives, um, I am fortunate that I actually have some, some solid data, some mid-year data to share with them, everybody, so that's exciting. And then some of the other things we've done at Washington, uh, including RTI PLC work, working on improving the climate and culture at Washington, and then uh, you know mo modeling this positive, um, supportive working and learning environment. I like to walk around and talk, but it looks sorry, like I've been well, drugged. That's, so that's fine. <laughs> I can see. <laughs> we want you to work the room yeah. not tonight. So, <laughs> so to understand really how the school success plans are set up. I wanted to show everybody a snapshot of what an iReady diagnostic looks like. So the color coding bands, the green stripe lines, that's really at grade level, okay, at grade level, so that's farthest to your left. And then you have the lighter colored green, which is like early on, close to grade level, uh, yellow is a year behind, and then the red band is two or more years uh, behind grade level. Um, so that's how you interpret the, uh, the iReady diagnostic. So our first objective here, this was based off kind of an annual year to year. Last year, spring of uh, 2021, Washington's ELA score proficiency was at 56%. We are looking to move that proficiency by five percentage points and then continue to grow that um, moving forward. Uh, the, the subgroup we're looking at the students with disabilities and then after our mid-year data which was collected mainly in January um, we had pretty good growth already so if you look where it says after diagnostic number two we increased our proficiency from 30 to 55 percent this was 56 we had a few kids that just finished the test up last week and it dropped by a percentage point we were at 56 percent last week so already we're at the same proficiency midway through the year at where, you know, compared to where Washington finished the end of the year last year. So we're really happy with that fall to mid-year growth so far in the area of ELA. Um, are, are some of our classes that experience the highest growth? Our fourth grade, fourth grade class grew by 175%, uh, fifth grade 135%, uh, third grade 110%. To give you some context, when we talk about 100% growth, 100% typical growth, that's what you would expect the average student to grow in a year, 100%, like a year's growth. 
So we have, on average, a lot of our upper elementary, third, fourth, and fifth grade, they're averaging more than a year's growth already in a, in a half a year. So again, super excited about some of the growth data that's coming in. Um, students with disabilities, 16 of 24, um, or 66.6, .6, rounded up to 67% of our students already met their stretch or typical growth um, in that subgroup. And then 92% of students with disabilities showed uh, improvement in the area of reading or ELA. And really, this was the heart of Washington's work in uh, PL PLC and RTI time. Really, what we focused on was ELA growth, and we saw some good movement in the numbers um, in this area. Objective number two, very similar to math. Last year, we finished at 60%. We're trying to bump that proficiency up to 65%. And again, monitoring that students with disabilities group to uh, close the achievement gap. At our mid-year data, we jumped up from, in the fall, 18% proficiency to mid-year 51. So that's an increase of 33% in that striped green band or, or light-colored green band. Uh, and then we had solid, really solid growth uh, in math across all the grade levels. And math is one where the kids generally don't make huge jumps. They make more incremental you know, kind of incremental gains as the teachers are, you know, teaching through a curriculum cycle in the classrooms. And then the last little note there, 100% of our students with disabilities showed improvement. So all our students with disabilities showed growth in the area of math in that, that cohort group. Just a little table to kind of, uh, kind of show you the numbers. So the way it's set up, you have last year's data, 2021 fall, winter, spring, so that those three data points, you can see the growth in ELA or reading from 26 to 56, and then math from 16% to 65. This year we have our two data points to the right, and we move from 30% to 55%, so an increase in 25 percentage points, where at the same time last year we only had increased 14 percentage points, and then in math we jumped up 33 percentage points, where last year they had only at this point jumped up 24 percentage points. Um, so again, we are on, and if you look at the jumps that the school made from winter to spring last year, 26 percent in ELA and then 25 uh, percent math, if we are similar to that, we should be in the, the high, high 70s, 80s range for proficiency in reading, and then um, in the mid 70s for math. Um, so so above where we'd like to be at, and again, um, you know, continue that on, to have that favorable growth. Objective number three for our school success plan, looked at school perception survey. For those people in the audience, this is an annual survey that our district and a lot of other schools in the state and across the nation take, and it really compares, it's a good comparison from school to school. And it's got different categories like equity on it, school connectedness, in that social emotional um, index value. And our uh, third objective focused on the social emotional aspect, um, which is kind of like school connectedness. So over on the left hand side, you can see the state average on this was uh, 3.17. It's on a four point scale, one through four. Uh, state average was a 3.17. Our uh, last year's fifth grade class, uh, Average 2.62, our current fifth grade class uh, 2.75, and then our fourth and fifth grade classes um, a little bit higher in the low three range. And what we what I've done is I've given the survey already in the fall, and then uh, in November, and then I'm going to be giving the survey again uh, latter part of February, and then again in the spring because a lot of the things that we're doing at school are really trying to move the needle on how kids feel involved in the school how they feel connected to adults, and how, in, in, which is connected to their, uh, their achievement. Um, so really working hard on, on doing a lot of things internally at Washington Elementary to get the kids excited and involved in school and move the numbers um, on this objective. So kind of a cool thing, and I'll show you some pictures at the end. We have a Friday morning meeting that typically we do virtually. So we'll jump on. Uh, we start with the Pledge of Allegiance, some announcements. We have Bulldog Pride Awards. So one of the things I've stressed uh, this year with the kids is 
you know, excellence in, in what you do and really setting a great example uh, in the classroom and then behaviorally for your fellow students. So we give out the Bulldog Pride Awards for uh, academic achievement as well as like behavioral excellence. So I announce the names. We do the stomp, stomp, clap as a, as a, as a school. It's kind of fun. Um, and then I get to call all the parents every Friday morning. So after the meeting's over, generally I spend most of my morning making 15 to 25 phone calls, and I do this on a weekly basis. So if we've done this for, you know, 20 weeks already, I've made, you know, probably 400 phone calls, and that's, that's one thing that's been very positive for parents to, to see the, cool, the school call on a Friday morning, and it's not because their kid is sick and they need to get picked up, it's because I'm sharing positive news because their kid is doing awesome things. Um, yeah, it's just, it's, it's wonderful to have those conversations with parents. Um, about the great things that their kids are doing at school. And it, it also gets the kids really excited about uh, the positive things that are happening. Uh, out of our SEL group, which is a subgroup at, of teachers, we've developed a student leadership group. And I'll show you a couple pictures, but one of the things we want our student, our student leaders to do is really step up and encourage and model those behaviors that we expect and uh, you know, just positively influence their peers to make good decisions. And some of the character, uh, core character values that we model at the school are respect, which, which is huge, uh, responsibility, integrity, and honesty are four of the character values that we're trying to build within the student leadership group. And then lots of fun stuff that our PTO is sponsored. So we have the paint tonight that we passed those little invites out for. We had a fun run, we got an obstacle course coming up, um, some, some uh, field trips. We did a reading challenge over Christmas, we gave away some incentives. And uh, yeah, just kind of some fun stuff to get the kids engaged and involved and excited about coming to school on a regular basis. Um, some other t professional development activities or things that we've done at school. Really getting, getting our teacher SLOs, those are those individual um, classroom goals dialed in to support our school success plan objectives, and then also to the, you know, supporting or nested under the strategic plans uh, and goals of the district. So really kind of having those like that hierarchy built in so they all support each other to further achievement. Uh, continual reflection of data that we do all the time. Uh, Prioritizing where support staff work in the classroom based off of need. It wasn't like you're just assigned support staff. It's like how are you going to use them and make sure that the, you know they're dialed in, working on small groups of interventions with the kids, so we can maximize our adult time with our kids and also maximize the times time the kids are in the classroom and what they're getting out of it. So those are a few of the the things that we've kind of doing on an ongoing basis at Washington, and also. One of my main goals that I work on is my messaging to students and staff. Uh, trying to get everybody on the same plan, the same bus, driving in the same direction for student achievement and also creating this just like positive, energetic environment at Washington Elementary so kids want to be at school and they achieve, again, achieve at the highest levels possible. Just a few pictures of some of the smiley faces at, at Washington. We had that literacy event where it was kind of themed um, books around the world. And then we had uh, some ethnic snacks at the end that the parents and kids that attended got to leave with some cool snacks. And um, it was great. We had 100, about 100 people turn out and the, the families that really loved it. This is a picture of our student leadership group. So we took them down to the music room and got a group photo. Those are the kids that are working on making a positive difference and influencing their peers in a positive way at the school. For February, it was random acts of kindness, kind of the theme. So we have, uh, we, got, we were able to get a list of names um, from an assisted living place in Beaver Dam and, and all our student leaders uh, made Valentine's uh, last week. So we delivered those on Friday. And this is just a picture of our kindergarten kids working on Valentine's um, that, were, that were passed out. Some of our Bulldog Pride recipients. So this is the little certificate that the kiddos get, um, you know, when they earn 100% on a test or they, 
you know, we're helping a friend in the hallway, something like that. So this is the, just one of the weekly pictures of just some kindergarten kids. This is our reading challenge. It was the kids that finished the reading log got submitted. We drew names, and then the, the big prize was a bike. So uh, whoever it was going to be, then I asked them and con called their parents what kind of bike they wanted, and then bought the bike based off of the age of the kids and that kind of stuff. Um, 100 Days was just last week in kindergarten. I don't know if the other schools <laughs> celebrated that as well, but it's kind of a huge deal in kindergarten. <laughs> so, 100 days of... Building brains. Yeah. Nice. Yeah, and they all dressed up like construction workers. And the poor kindergarten teachers at the end of the day, oh my gosh, they're always exhausted. They were just like completely wiped out at the end of, end of that day. And then this was just uh, Friday. So Ooh. this is me. When we had the, the bulldog uh, assembly down in the gymnasium, and I told them we had a contest. I said the group with, uh, and again, trying to message and pump the kids up and get them excited. Um, the class that had the highest growth would be able to pie the teacher and second place class got a pizza party. So our fourth grade classes actually won the incentive, but um, two nice guys, Mr. Holm and Mr. Teets, they deferred to first grade. So we actually had six first grade students uh, throw the pies. So I filled up six <laughs> pie tins. Um, all the, the whole rest of school is in the back. We come to three and they line up and they hit me in the face. So uh, <laughs> luckily I was smart enough to bring a change of clothes before work because it took me a little while to get the, the whipped cream off me. Um, so that was our celebration last Friday. And then looking ahead, uh, just continue to look at data. Um, I share data with our support staff, with our teachers. We're going to look at data again on Friday. Um, because I think data really tells, tells you know, where, you, where you're at, where you're going, and then kind of sets the goals of where you're going to go to. And I try to include everybody with that. Um, constant discussion of PLC RTI. This messaging of uh, a culture of excellence and high achievement. And then using our student leadership group to uh, kind of that ground roots, um, you know, building the students up and just, uh, you know, Everybody needs to be respectful. Everybody needs responsible. This is how we operate at Washington Elementary and just continue, continuing on with that messaging within our school climate and culture. Um, that's about it. So, any questions for me? Question for you regarding the student leadership group. Is, are there representatives from every grade? Yep. Um, so, and they had to apply, so mm -hmm. we had developed uh, applications based off the different grade levels. Like, kindergarten was pretty simplistic versus uh, fifth grade, they had to write like short answer, essay type answers. Mm -hmm. And it was how they demonstrated uh, responsibility and respect and honesty and integrity. So again, reinforcing those, you know, get them, getting them to reflect upon those core values too at school. So it was an application, we screened them as teachers, we selected them. Um, based off the applicants. And we already had uh, our initial training and then we did some random acts of kindness. And then one of our lower areas on our SEL index, SSP objective number three was how kids res resolve conflict. So we're gonna do some training with our fourth and fifth graders and then have them step down and be able to like coach and help out in some situations with some of the younger elementary as well. So again, connecting some of our student leadership with, with the school success plan objective number three. Paul, just a question on, on the, one of the first slides you showed was the diagnostic where the highest growth was with the fourth grade. Was that growth from fall to winter or, or what was the time period that, that 175? Yep, that was percent? fall to winter. Okay, okay. Yeah, fall to winter. I really enjoyed the tour. We hit every classroom. Yeah. And yeah, I want to thank the board members that came out last week. That was nice to have you over and see the school. I was just really impressed. Like John said, we popped into, I think, almost every classroom. And the number of kids that were working independently or in small groups, you know, when the teacher was working with a small group, but all of those kids were on task. Like they were doing 
work. They weren't horsing around. They weren't running around. And it was obvious they just knew what they were doing. Um, and we even got to be like part of a, a fraction lesson. So I was <laughs> impressed with that. I was impressed that they said uh, there were three of us standing there that there was a young woman and, and I like got a vote. So right. I was still young. So that was, I was happy. <laughs> So, you, no, very you, nice to her. Very good day. Thank you for that. Thanks. How'd you do on the fraction? I I was good. <laughs> <laughs> three out of three had polka at some point in our lives, so that was good too. Lisa didn't ask us to do dancing demonstrations of polka. Yeah. <laughs> Any other questions for Paul? I have one more question um, on the connectedness surveys. Do you ever do something to see how the teachers feel connected to the school? Uh, well, it, we, that survey itself, I mean, we use the exact same language that School Perceptions use, uses on okay. that survey. I copied it, created a form. It was a third grade, fourth grade, the, even the rating scale is the exact same, so I want to replicate that, like, exactly. Okay. Um, we, you know, we look at the data. We've looked at that data as a staff multiple times this year because I w want everybody to know, like, if we have areas that are weak, how can we work together to build those numbers up? And it's really not the numbers, it's how the kids feel. So we're making, you know, creating a change in the environment so the kids feel a different way so that they'll answer those questions in a different way. And again, yeah, kids should absolutely feel connected. They should feel like they have friends. They should feel like they have an adult to talk to. Um, you know, all those, those things that should happen. Um, and we're constantly, that's part of the improvement, school improvement um, that's ongoing. But our data uh, at third grade and fourth grade showed really nice growth, and um, yeah, we're going to be in a good spot moving ahead. One of the things when we were visiting with some of the staff there prior to our tour um, was talking about some of the strategies they've been using with the, the new literacy program that they felt maybe helped with some of the, that growth. Um, but I know that there's been a lot of hard work by a lot of that staff, and that's not typical growth. That's pretty amazing so congratulations yeah, I, our, on that our kids our staff everybody is really doing an awesome job I can't I'm very grateful to be where I'm at right now mm -hmm. anything else for Paul would you prefer a different kind of pie being thrown at you <laughs> <laughs> so I filled them up like too early it was whipped cream out of a can oh. oh and it actually by the time we threw them it was liquidy so a couple of them went like you know 30 feet beyond me when they, <laughs> they hit me, so I'll wait till right before this Emily to, <laughs> or use cool up next time. <laughs> mm -hmm. All right, thank you very much, Thanks. Paul. Appreciate it. Thank you. All right, that moves us on to 9.3, school resource officer update. I think uh, Mark will start us out here. At, at this point in time, I would like to invite uh, Chief Kreisiger to come on up to the podium with our school resource officers, all three of them. Yeah, you bet. <laughs> so um, I'm going to turn this over to Chief in, in just a moment, but I just want to reiterate how fortunate we are as a district to have the type of partnership that we do with, uh, with our police department. Um, they've been remarkably supportive and helpful on a variety of fronts. And if we can close our eyes and think back to some of the things that we've navigated um, as a district, they've, they've always been outstanding. And we really appreciate our continued uh, partnership and we're very fortunate to also have always had school resource officers um, uh, since I've been here that have been remarkably committed and invested um, in our school not just our community and, and have a passion um, and a special spot in their heart for our, for our kids so chief thank your you, turn Mark. I appreciate those kind words I know you have a busy agenda so I don't want to take up a lot of your time but I felt this was kind of important um, what I'm here for is I want to introduce you to our school resource officers and I want to thank you for that excellent working relationship we have. And I say we, we say the police in the school. So we, we look at, I kind of look at how, why our program has been successful for so many years and that's because of this excellent partnership we have. And we look forward to that continuing to grow. So we are, we are here to work with your staff and your students and your parents. That's what we're here for. The world out there is totally different than your liaison officers working in the school. So we've had some changes. We have a new position in the school. We have a retirement that came about this year. Um, and we had one change. 
So, and that was a thanks to a lot of your staff helping me pick out the right officers for the right positions. And I thank them for all being involved. That was great help for me to make sure we got that right person into that right position. Um, so that was something that's really important. It gave us an opportunity tonight, the reason I have them here, gives you an opportunity to put up face with a name. So what I'm gonna do is have them come up, introduce themselves and say a little bit if they wish to. Guess I'll go first. Um, so my name is Tony Carroll. I'm actually the school resource officer for the high school. I'm a little bit about myself. I've been a police officer in the city of Beardam for 22 years. Um, I took over for Kevin Rohde, who held the position for about 12 years. And I would say that this year, it was like trial by fire. Uh, I hit the ground running. And as far as law enforcement calls, I, I looked at some numbers um, this evening, or I actually say after school here, just to kind of give you some idea. Um, at the high school, we've probably doubled the law enforcement related calls or police complaints than what we had all of last year, ready at the halfway point. There's a couple things obviously attribute to that. It could be because there was maybe no structure with kids. Everybody's back in the building. It took a little bit of time to get things going. Um, I'm in a way better spot right now for this next semester than I was the first semester. Um, I feel more at ease and I have a better routine. I've had the opportunity to meet a lot of great people, staff and students here. Administration's been great um, to work with and they've really helped me get settled into the position. So I don't wanna, you know, I wanted to give you guys kind of an idea of, you know, some things that come went on, but I don't want it to be like bad news because there's been a lot of good relationships that I've created in this position and I've truly enjoyed it so far. So if you have any questions for me, um, I'm kind of like the senior guy, I guess you'd say, because I got the <laughs> most time ready in the school <laughs> for a half, for a semester, but I'm open for questions if you, uh, if I can give you an idea of like, if you're inquiring about what type of calls I've dealt with or, you know, um, I'm open. Are you at school? Oh, well, I am, um, my office is here. Um, Chief kicked me out and said, you, you have to move all your stuff here. So um, I am here, I would say, probably anywhere from 90 to 95% of my day is in this building. Um, I do check in from time to time at the station just to catch up on things that need to be there. Um, but I am here most of the time. A lot of my um, attention is... I guess being all just present, visible in the hallways, especially in the morning, in between bell periods, lunchtime passings, because those are the times that I've already known that when things are gonna happen, whether that be small dis disturbances that administration may need help with or things that involve me more thoroughly, um, though it's important that I'm out, out there. Um, you have to understand that in this job, you know, it, it takes some time for I guess kids maybe to build some trust with who you are. Mm -hmm. And I think I've done a pretty good job here already for my first semester with the student body and get my face out there for kids and know how, how I am. And I've had a lot of just students just come to my office in general, you know, whether that be they feel comfortable to talk about how their day is going or the things they're involved with. Not so much just like, hey, I had something stolen, I need to talk to a cop. But it's it's a bigger. I've learned that's just a bigger, um, a bigger job than I've ever thought it would be. And it, I think in the end, it's going to be really rewarding. I have twin daughters who are in seventh grade at the middle school, um, so a little bit myself and my family too with the district. So I have invested interest in our schools as well. Not only just being here, but as a parent. So. Thanks. Thank you. I guess we're going to work our way down. Our way down from <laughs> so I'm Andy Stracota. I've been here at the police department for, well, basically the same as Tony, 22 years. I can't tell you a ton about the middle school because I've been there for two weeks. <laughs> um, the benefit I have is I went in, my transition in there has been pretty easy, I think. It's not a good word to use, but 
I know so many of these kids. I've coached middle school football for five years, so I know a lot of those guys. I've coached baseball and hockey, what have you. I have a lot of connections with a lot of these kids. It's paid off already. We had some stuff last week. Two of my football kids came to me because they were comfortable with me, and we took care of it. Um, like I said, I've been there two weeks. <laughs> um, I know Tony, and you'll meet Mr. Edwards. Our plan is between the three of us, we're kind of our, a three-man team. Um, if I need help, Tony and I have had a lot of conversations because I'm kind of figuring it out as I go. Um, a big thing to me is just being seen. Um, today, I had a good day. <laughs> so I was able to just pop in classrooms, meet teachers that I don't know, spend some time. Um, they're all, come anytime you want. Pop in the back of the class and hang out. Um, they see me. So any questions for me? I'll do what I can, but. <laughs> good luck. I'm good. I like it. I'm happy. Good. Well, I'm, I'm the newest officer. Um, I'm Matthew Edwards. Um, I've been with the department about four and a half years. I hit five years in May, so not as much experience as these guys back here. I'm coming off of night shift. I've been doing about four years on night shift now, so I'm sleeping like a normal person now and, you know, seeing the sun, so that's great. Um, but uh, so I cover all five elementary schools, and then, like Andy said, kind of be there for Tony or him if they need it. Um, I got the opportunity in November when Tony was on some time off to fill in at the high school for about two weeks, which was great. Um, kind of reconfirmed that it was something that I wanted to do with my career with being an SRO, so been kind of just jumping around the middle schools, learning the middle school layout. Um, it's a little bit new because I'm able to be there a little bit more than the previous one was just because she covered the middle school and all the elementary schools. So just being a presence, um, go by Officer Edwards or Officer Matt or the kindergartners call me policeman. So <laughs> um, just kind of being there, um, learning teachers, learning the administration and just being able to be there. But like um, Andy said, going on week three. So. I can answer any questions if you got them too. So you're trying to do one school a week then? Or uh, I split them. Or? I usually split them about half day at each school. So about 8 to noon and then anywhere from 12.15, 12.30 to 4.30. So it gets me there before the kids there there at school and there after school in case there's any issues. Um, like Tony, I've had a couple complaints for police issues, but more just the presence of being there, talking to kids. I'm leading passer right now at recess at Washington, I think. I mean, I'm, I'm throwing touchdowns all the time to the kids. <laughs> so getting out there, being, being playing games with them. Um, I already got kids already saying, oh, are you coming out to recess with me? So it's kind of a cool fact to see the kids interact with me already only on week three. <laughs> I don't think the ball's got to get to them. So, I mean... <laughs> Thank you so much. It's just Thank it's you. so great to meet you guys and uh, put a put a personality to the names, and uh, I'm excited to see the things you do because I think you've already got a great start in your couple of weeks of building some positive relationships that I'm sure is going to bear fruit over the upcoming year. So thank you so much. I'm excited to see what's next. Yeah, and I really I really look at two things. I mean, you, you it people sometimes overlook the importance of of, of, of a building relationship with a police officer and kids. And you know, we've got that started now on the elementary level, right? Up through middle school and up through high school. So these kids see a presence, uh, a police presence all the way through their school career. I think that's important. Um, and quite honestly, I mean, I, I thank the rest of the board too, because we've made a decision to increase our presence when a lot of other communities are going the other direction. And so mm -hmm. I think it's really important that we stay uh, stay the course. I think we got some great officers here that are in our schools, and I think uh, we've done a good job of supporting it. Though I, I thank you guys as well. Thank you. Wait, she's thank got. You for I just want to say, well, I don't know Officer Carroll like personally, but I always see him around school, and he's super nice. Like I always say good morning and hi, so like that just feels comforting knowing that he's like actually nice and he's not scary. You haven't gotten to know him yet, Toby. <laughs> I did not pay her to say that either. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Thank you guys very much. Appreciate Thank it. You.
Thank you, guys. All right, that moves us to 9.4. We have a summer school 2022 update. Hello, everybody. Um, this is just going to be a quick summer school update for the 2022 summer school. Um, even though it doesn't seem like it's that uh, close, we are getting there. So just to start off, we have the dates and locations. So for elementary and middle school, it's going to start on June 13th and will run until July 28th. There will be school Monday through Thursday and then no school the week of July 4th. It is going to take place at Lincoln Elementary this year, as well as Jefferson Elementary. So that's a little bit of a change. Um, the past two years, it's been at Prairie View and Jefferson. Prairie View needs some HVAC work, some deep cleaning from the past two years. So we are um, going to switch to Lincoln Elementary. For the high school, it's going to be June 13th through July 29th. And this is going to run Monday through Friday for the course credit recovery. Um, so just some updates on delivery. So all will be in person. Um, elementary school, we are going to go back to how it was run in 2019. So this will look like students rotating through four periods. They'll have three academic slash enrichment and then one lunch and recess. In middle school, it's going to be the academic and enrichment. They'll rotate through three periods, each at 60 minutes. And then for the high school, it's going to be summer school in person again, and we will also be investigating the possibility of running two separate three-week classes instead of the standard six-week long classes. Again, the credit recovery will be the primary focus for high school. Um, our health and safety protocols, they will be aligned with our current practices, and then we will review further as we get closer and adjust where necessary. Free lunch program and transportation. We will continue to collaborate with our food service to provide lunch to students at no cost to our families. Um, because it is bid year for our food service, we're not exactly, exactly sure who we are going to be working with, but depending on who that is, we will continue to provide two lunch for our students for no cost. Um, we will also continue to provide transportation using our Badger bus. And summer school is no cost and no charge for most courses. Uh, some enrichment courses may have the material cost, but that will be no more than $5, and the free and reduced are waived from fees. And that's it. Pretty quick overview. Any questions? So is this different this year that high school is in person every day, five days a week? Because wasn't it before like some independent study with checking in or? John, do you have any guidance on that? Okay. Okay. I noticed you have a time built in for the elementary school lunch. Is yep. the middle school lunch, should they just take it when they leave? Or how um, I'm not exactly sure how the middle school is going to look quite yet. Um, they have a coordinator up there that is kind of putting together the schedule. So she is working on that this okay. week. And once we have it, we can share it with you. So one more question. Just in elementary, when you say that there's three... Uh, academic enrichment and what was the other word yep so the academic so if a student would be recommended for a, like a core class so they would have mm -hmm. to be recommended if they were 30 percent or below in their i ready winter data so kind of what paul was showing okay. um so we have percentiles so they would be recommended for either a math or a reading core course and then they would be put in those but then they could also have one enrichment course okay um so it wouldn't necessarily be like a cohort it would be blocks so parents can pick whether their students go to um, like the math or the reading if they aren't recommended for it and then however many enrichment that they decide that they would like to choose okay so if they don't need the in, if they don't need the academic supports then they can take all enrichment courses correct yep okay so and that's that's sorry Gary that's a little different how last year it was um, very cohorted so if they took one core class then they would be enrolled just without a choice in the other ones which we saw a little bit of a decline in our enrollment so trying to just go back to how things were pre-COVID to get some enrollment back up okay how does busing work um not quite sure yet in the past what it's been done is students who are recommended for a core class so um the students who are 30 percent or below they would receive busing because they're recommended from us and from the teachers the other students we've done <coughs> shuttle buses in the past to pick up um some of the reason why we went with lincoln and jefferson is they were central locations so for some of our students who need some of those core courses they were able to walk there instead of needing that transportation where prairie view is kind of out in a place that it requires to be transported. 
And both of those schools have good climate control in the summer, right? Correct. Yep. They are both climate control. They have the space. So, yes, they will Every be good to go. Every parent want to know that. Yep. Yep. So, since the high school is running on Friday, mm -hmm. um, will that impact them for busing and or lunch? I don't believe so. We should be able to work it out. It's been done in the past. Mm-hmm. Anything else? Thank you. Okay, thank you. Did we need a motion for that? Yeah, it would be good um, just to approve the base plan. I mean, obviously, logistically, there could be some things that polish up, but I think the dates um, and the locations are helpful too. So, make a motion we approve the dates and uh, locations as presented for our summer school programs. Second. Second. All right, we have a motion and a second then to approve the uh, summer school presentation is presented. All in favor? Aye. 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 All those not, same sign. All right. Thank you very much for that report. Appreciate it. Uh, that gives us a uh, 9.5 return to learn update. All right, so we will follow a similar format uh, to what we have in the past. Our goals, provide an update on community metrics, update on specific realities associated with our district and other area districts, and then provide an opportunity for questions, comments, and discussion. So as far as monitoring uh, COVID-19 is concerned, again, we continue, all the Dodge County uh, superintendents continue to meet with the health department on a regular basis. Uh, they've gone through a number of transitions uh, with some of their staff, but they have, uh, generally speaking, been really good about making sure that they join us uh, for a meeting and provide us um, with updates or context that is relevant. Uh, as far as our boundary reports are concerned, uh, we can see uh, confirmed cases over the last seven days. As of today, Valentine's Day, um, 62 in our district boundary as compared to January 7th, 262, um, so obviously a drastic uh, downturn. Uh, positive seven day average um, as of today would be 8.86 in the district boundary itself, which is down from 37.42 in January. And then hospitalizations, um, again, people can access this information on the Department of Health website for the state of Wisconsin. They can click on any hospital region they want. Uh, but I think for the first time, uh, both the actual hospitalization and patients in ICU um, is designated as shrinking. That is the term that they use. Uh, confirmed and probable cases. So here is the county uh, metrics for confirmed and probable since March of 2020 to today. So I think we're all generally aware the state, our region, I think the country saw an uptick um, right, right after or right during kind of that holiday period. And we've also seen now a drastic uh, downturn. If you actually follow the, the graph down when it's live on a feed, it'll tell you like the exact numbers. Um, and um, from this weekend, I think just in our county, I think there were only three, I wanna say three uh, confirmed, probable case, or confirmed or probable cases that they identified. Uh, COVID activity, I continue to summarize kind of by month once we get more than a month past a month. Uh, that makes sense. So September, you see um, October and uh, November and December all basically did an average for those. You see that at the top. Um, and now we have January, uh, which we saw an increase in the percent positive. Um, and that highest rate was that week of the 17th. Um, and now we're down to the lowest uh, percent positive that we have had, I believe, since monitoring this, and that is as of today, 0.19%. No staff, seven students. District snapshot comparison. Um, so January 3rd, um, if you guys recall that, that's kind of when we were starting to see some increases. Now fast forward to, at this point in time, um, every. Dodge County District last, last week reported that they had less than 1% positivity rate for COVID-19. What had happened too, 
Um, if people want to go on individual websites and explore, they can. But usually I get those and I ask for them um, and I get them all on, on one day. So we're kind of comparing apples to apples. But I got them all smattering from different days of the week. And our own percentage had changed, still below one. Um, and some of the other district percentages, based on whether or not I got that information on, let's say, that Tuesday or that Thursday, um, they had changed. So uh, they were all uh, as low as many of them have seen in a uh, long time, essentially. Process update. So one of the things that we, uh, we do um, is we send kind of standard close contact notifications out anytime there's a, a close contact in schools. Um, the intent is to be moving away from that standard close contact notification. There's a general thought and conversation about the fact that essentially if you're leaving your home at this point in time, um, having two years, having navigated this for two years, you should consider yourself possibly a, a close contact, any interaction that you have out in public. Um, the other thing is with our notifications, one of the follow-ups is, or one of the expectations is um, that you're monitoring for your symptoms. That's a general health expectation. Um, so we don't necessarily believe that we should be sending those out every time. There's, a, there's a, a generalized close contact in the schools and we've also found and heard from parents too that's diluting our communication process um, because of those notifications that are going out. We would still um, send notifications to families if there's reason to believe there's a classroom outbreak. So if there's multiple classes in a, uh, multiple cases in a classroom, the nurses and the health department look into that. Um, and if there's any reason to believe that that could be associated with the classroom and not necessarily a happenstance because of you know multiple um, household realities or other factors outside of school, we would still send communication out uh, for that. As far as resource and reference, uh, one of the things that we plan to do is launch a web page uh, by the end of the week to serve as a ready resource for families that are navigating isolation timelines and other questions associated with COVID. I think our nurses have done an amazing job throughout this entire process. They've had to navigate a number and a variety of, of questions um, that, that uh, could be beyond stressful at times. But a lot of this, again, having been two years kind of into this as a society, a lot of these things can be answered simply by working through a reference document. Um, and when it comes to timelines, there are actually resources out there. Um, our state's Department of Health does not have the resource, uh, but one of the other Midwest states does, South Dakota, has a really nice resource that people can go on and based on kind of the reality that they're navigating, they can literally enter in a date of symptom onset or last contact, depending on what it applies to, and it actually can provide them with a recommended date that maybe they would either come back to school or they would be out in public again, et cetera. This doesn't replace the fact that our nurses are still gonna have to have some conversations with people, but I think um, the more simple references and resources that are out there that align with what we're doing in general and what our timelines are, um, just helps maybe minimize uh, the amount of um, other things or other variables the nurses have to navigate. So just making that available and then encouraging parents um, to use that as a resource for a quick reference. So those are the two process update references. Questions, comments, any other discussion? So I have one thing, a general board question. And of course you weigh in if you want. But one, <clears throat> it seems like we do this return to learn plan all the time, every month, and a lot of it's redundant. And I'm wondering if we um, maybe kind of change course because some of the numbers that we see here we can see on our website if we want to see them and maybe change course and maybe just if there's something going on or I don't know how to put this then maybe we go from a monthly update to maybe like a quarterly broad health update of the, of the district itself you know um, instead of just you know and focus besides just focusing everything on COVID all the time that maybe you know once every three months that we have a, a broad range of any health issues or concerns among student and staff. And Mark's always really good at bringing updates to us anyways if something needs to change. And I think we've kind of given that authority that if he needs to make changes that he can, that you know, he can and he get in contact with us. I'm just kind of looking like, well, is this something that we have to revisit every month or is this something that maybe we can look at every three months with the idea that if something needs to be changed or Mark needs something that he 
gets a hold of us or sticks it in the agenda or or like here we had a process update you know that was something new this time you know so I don't know what you guys think to me you know I just think it makes a little sense but I actually agree when we when we were doing these reports monthly it was because we were needing to make decisions and now they're updates and they're not a decision making document so I feel comfortable getting that information through the website or weekly uh, the board notes and things like that but um I think I'm comfortable with um, and like John said there's other health issues we can talk about attendance rates and things like that um, that aren't necessarily COVID but important to kids learning that I we could we could change the update and do it less frequently I, I just like the idea of a bigger picture because there's other you know there's other health related things going on I would uh, you know I would guess but you know it's you know just a thought I think as long as the guidance is still that masking is required on transportation and that our students are still required to follow along with those guidelines that we do still need a monthly update because there are things that are still pertinent across the country even if our county may or may not believe they are um, there is still a situation at hand and we need to address it because our students are impacted especially in the by way of transportation specifically mm -hmm. with regard to this I also think because spring break is coming up and that will be another situation where people will be going to a variety of other places um, that potentially we could see a spike after spring break and that we should just continue to monitor it accordingly once a month I don't think is too much to ask to be able to say where do we currently stand mm -hmm. especially when we only have three months left of school yeah, I mean, it doesn't couple. it doesn't take me a long time to put it together yeah we only have a couple months left of school I guess I think continue yeah. I think regardless um, you know one of the things that I think just internally that we need to process a little bit is you know what what would things look like when when whoever determines that it's an endemic hopefully that that happens mm -hmm. right um, you know what is that what does that look like and do we move to a quarterly um, you know like at the end of each quarter um, or maybe it's a semester when we do you know other updates where we can just provide some more broad context as far as how things are going um, because one of the big you know the big challenges with this whole reality hasn't just been cases it's been attendance it's been absences mm -hmm. and we're trying to navigate actively and on a regular basis our principals are doing a great job and they're trying to get kids to be in school more because we have situations where you know people people may be out a little bit more than they need to and and we've given a lot of flexibility with some other things because of that health precautions and responding to a pandemic and um, in some areas it's making it hard to grow um, and achieve where we, we want to be so I think there's relevance um, and opportunity beyond that but as far as the amount of time you know do I like focusing on it once a month no but you know it's, it's it is relevant there's only a few months of school left so I don't I don't have a problem either way um, yeah that's good I mean I just food for thought you know mm -hmm. that's all just so I throw it out there I just for from my standpoint too um, <clears throat> I don't know if I anticipate any grand you know changes and recommendations or otherwise um, you know other information could come out that would change that so part of me is a little bit apologetic that sometimes it's pretty just flat as far as a presentation is concerned but it was great news to see the numbers going down yeah, I, I, great. yeah. good to hear it's really good I can really understand it. I guess it was something I hadn't put a lot of thought in, but how much of the staff time it was taking, doing the contract tracing, following up, you know, and, and really knowing where our kids are. Are they out for this reason or that reason and uh, making sure. So I, I um, applaud your decision to kind of move ahead. And I'm understanding this, this website, I understand, is very easy to navigate. The one Super that you'll be easy. recommending and it's user friendly. So yep. it'll be an asset to folks. Really easy. Okay. Any, Any other, other questions? Comments, questions for Mark? Thank you for your work, as yeah. always. Thank you very much.
All right, that brings us to, well, yep. Yeah, we can just move on. Um, strategic plan mid-year update. Hello, thank you for letting me be here tonight. I'm gonna provide an update on our strategic actions uh, as part of our strategic plan. So we know within our strategic plan, we have our strategic <coughs> objectives, and then out of those flow our metrics, our school success plans, and our strategic actions. You'll hear more about the success plans and district metrics at the Teaching and Learning Committee next week. So we know we have our, our four core strategies, student growth and achievement, staff effectiveness and development, facilities and operations, and district and community engagement. Out of those, we have our strategic actions. So we have eight strategic actions. The first one is uh, to intensify and diversify our recruitment efforts and strategies to increase applicant pools. So progress that has been made on that DSA uh, so far this year is we are really focusing on the student teachers we've been able to have in our district this year and when they finish their student teaching, trying to get them into substitute roles, long-term sub roles, or even hiring them on uh, for vacancies we have. We're also doing uh, more proactive hiring and hiring earlier in some of the areas that are very high demand areas, areas that are a little bit harder to fill, and areas that we anticipate we have openings coming in. Example, maybe special education. Um, maybe there's not an opening right now, but we know there will be an opening in the future. Uh, and some good news is for the first time uh, in a couple years, uh, our HR team will be attending in-person career fairs at some <laughs> of colleges and universities. So you think how we're progressing on those D that D DSA and how that will translate to uh, some of our metrics. If you look at our uh, certified staff retention rate, uh, that shows how we're able to keep and maintain some of our staff. And we see from the last school year into this school year, we were able to retain uh, nearly 90% of our staff in the certified realm. Our second DSA focuses on increasing community perceptions by providing regular focused communications in areas of a perceived performance gap. So that goes back to our family perception survey and there are areas where families share that we were not doing as well as they perceived uh, we should be doing. So what we've been doing for progress on that is we have monthly dispatch, district dispatch newsletters that are sent to families. And we've really been focusing on uh, more communication and communication in social media focused on some of these areas. An example would be post-secondary plans. So communicating with families how we are preparing students for life after high school, college career readiness. Uh, a piece that's coming up on that will be uh, a career readiness profile that students and parents will have access to and it'll be a nice tool to show where uh, our kids are at. And that we will measure how we're doing on this DSA as we come into this spring and we have our families take the school perception survey. Our third strategic action focuses on the further development and uh, the use of data-based decision making for instructional adjustments among grade level and department teams. So we have time each week for our teams to be able to meet. And at the elementary level, we have really rolled out the teaching and assessment cycle. I know that was observed by board members at the Prairie View visit, but that's where teachers sit down and they look at a unit coming up and decide what are those key standards within that unit? How are they gonna assess those standards during the unit? and then as the unit progresses, uh, identifying students that need additional support and identifying students that already have the end skills and how they're gonna help accelerate those students. So again, that's, that's embedded at our elementary level and that's uh, being initiated at the middle and high school levels. We also have uh, regular progress monitoring in English language arts and in math. So thinking about how we will measure this, we'll look at our uh, student achievement. An example is our elementary achievement. If we look at specifically at grades three through five, uh, we have our mid-year iReady data that has come in, and that is projecting that we will have an increase in our proficiency rates on the forward exam in this upcoming year compared to past years. Our fourth DSA is to implement a universal 
social emotional screener to identify and provide intervention to students in need. This DSA has been accomplished. We provided that at grades four, six, and nine for students uh, in the fall. Students will take it again this spring. So after students took that screener, students that had elevated scores were then discussed within building level teams for what supports they may need. And some of those students were already receiving support, so it helped to um, justify some of the services we're already providing. Thinking about how we will measure how we do on that DSA, we'll look at our student perceptions data uh, and student engagement in this spring. Our fifth DSA focuses on using standards-based approach when developing individual education plans, IEPs, so that students have the same access to and opportunities and closing achievement gaps. So our IEP teams are using the standards when writing IEPs, and increasingly teams are having students with IEPs involved in regular education classes more frequently, and when students are pulled for specific instruction, it's very targeted. So I didn't tie this back to a specific um, district metric, but I think it is important to note that this year, when we received our feder federal progress on uh, IDA, Individu uh, Individuals with Disabilities Act, we showed, much, we showed a lot of growth in our score, and that was because we had an increase in the amount of, in the percentage of students with IEPs that graduated on time. We had a decrease in dropout rates for our students with disabilities. And again, it showed that we are increasingly have, having more of our students with disabilities in regular education classes more of the time. So that was a very, very nice positive to see. Our sixth DSA focuses on uh, our five-year facility plan, assessing that and updating it, uh, also looking at some large, long-range, large-scale property acquisition. So in November, there was the board workshop on that, and then in December, the board did approve some large-scale projects for this summer. Uh, we are still exploring potential options uh, for property acquisition, and we are evaluating our progress on this DSA with our financial metrics, and we see our fund balance is increasing, and our mill rate is decreasing. The seventh DSA is to implement a revised educator effectiveness model, and that's focused on coaching and feedback. So all of our principals have been trained uh, and certified in this new model. We have monthly uh, updates and reminders and support to make sure that we are continuing to, to follow that effectively. And then we also have professional development opportunities internally with our administrative team as well as partnering with uh, external resources. So that'll come through uh, again with all of our student achievement metrics, seeing how our, our kids are performing. And then our final DSA focuses on implementing an instructional coaching model that supports the growth of our tier one instruction, so our instruction for all students. So we currently have five instructional coaches, three of them at the middle school and two at the elementary. Last year we had one instructional coach, which was uh, at the elementary. The coaches meet uh, multiple times each month and they learn about coaching and, and calibrating and refining their own skills for how they can help the staff members they work with. And then our mid-year data from the coaches uh, shows that the educators they are working with really are feeling an impact for their time with them. And uh, putting that back to some of our metrics, if we look specifically at our middle school achievement, since this is the first year we've had coaches at the middle school and we have three of them, uh, again, our mid-year iReady data is showing an increase in proficiency and projecting that we will have an increase in both our ELA proficiency rates and math proficiency rates at the middle school level. So our next steps with our strategic plan would be next week at, you, uh, at the Teaching and Learning Committee, you're going to hear more about our specific data metrics and our school success plan progress. Then March and April is when we have all of our standardized state assessments at grades three through 11. And it's also when our school perception survey goes out to staff and families and students. Then in May and in June, we get our end of the year data back and start to review that. July, 
board meeting is when you'll get the final report on our strategic plan update and our, our data. And then August, we start the cycle all over again with a board workshop for next year and our goals and our actions and our metrics. So again, that was meant to be kind of a, a high level update on the district strategic actions. Are there any questions or is there anything I can do for you tonight? I have, um, I have two questions. First of all, um, who's, who gets to go to the in-person career fairs? Nicole, I would imagine. <laughs> yes, uh, Stacy Drews and I go to the career fairs, although um, Oh, okay. So that'll be good. So, um, yeah, but typically it's Stacy and I. Okay. And, um, Jesse, you talked about the district dispatch newsletter. You know, with the SRO, with the school resource officers that were just, have we presented them in any of the dispatch newsletters? Uh, I don't believe we have. That's a nice idea. Yeah. I think it would be kind of good to, you know, we want to make sure we keep promoting that, you know, especially for elementary kids, the policeman is your friend and that kind of stuff mm -hmm. and that they're there to help. And so I, I think it would be a great thing to use that for. Thank you. Yep. Thank you. Any other questions? Jesse, for number four, for your social emotional screener, how are we, how are parents informed? of their students' score, and how are parents involved then in the process where students are identified that they have a need? That's a good question, Lisa, and I don't have the answer to that. I okay. can bring that back for next week, and I'll work with Dr. Schieffer on that. I don't know what the notification is of scores. I don't know if students or parents receive that, uh, but I do know when we have students that we work through uh, um, trying to, to solve some problems, parents are a part of that, and we talk about what plans we are putting into place and what families can do, what schools can do to help because we know with that partnership, we just have greater. greater yeah, I'm impact. just thinking that that would be outside of IEP potentially, Correct. that this would obviously impact the greater student population. It could be a student with Correct. or without IEP. Just because a yeah. student has an IEP doesn't necessarily exactly. mean they do or don't have social emotional learning needs. So Correct. that doesn't preclude or. Um, exactly, which is why I them. felt yeah. as though maybe there's. Maybe there's an opportunity there for confirming how we notify parents. Correct. Any other questions for Jesse? Thank you for your time. See you next week. Thanks, Jesse. So I think in addition to Lisa's question, if you review the information on the high level summary and there's anything in there that you specifically want answered or want more information about, in addition to what Jesse's already going to bring to teaching and learning, please reach out to Jesse so he can prepare that information. All right. All right, that brings us back around to So is there getting a slide uh, to put up there? So obviously we had the public hearing tonight. We've went through this obviously in committee. So Anne-Marie will quickly summarize that and, uh, and we'll go ahead and get our approval. Okay, well there. Um, so yeah, so as part of uh, the requirements for getting the ASTRA 3 funding, um, we had, had the hearing tonight. Um, and so what we would be looking for at this point um, is for the board approval of the um, plan um, that was presented, um, including the flexibility um, to, um, to be able to amend, um, amend the plan um, over the next two and a half years that we have to spend it um, based on the needs of the students and the district's budget. I'll move that we uh, <clears throat> approve the ESSER plan.
planned fund use as presented with the ability to amend the plan as needed to serve the needs of our students and staff. Second. All right, we have a motion and a second. Um, and I believe we need a roll call vote on that motion. Marge Jorgensen? Yes. John Krause? Yes. Mary Coons? Yes. Maria Mason? Yes. 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 Thank you. All right. Reports by the board. Starting out with our most important report. <laughs> Turn it over to you. Um, hi, everyone. Um, I don't have a lot, but that's okay. <laughs> so first thing, pasta with a purpose happened. I saw some people there. It was very successful there's a lot of people there and then at the basketball game after there was a lot of people so I think that was good to have everyone get together and stuff so also at the high school the ACT is coming up in March so Mr. Chaunton's working to kind of get kids excited although colleges aren't requiring it anymore it still shows like growth for our school so he's having like a pep rally in homerooms so kids can so kids try on it basically instead of just blowing it off. So he's gonna give in, like share the incentives. So like, if you improve your score, you can get certain things, or if you get a certain score, you can get senior release or um, final exam exemption. So those are good incentives that I think kids try to go for a lot. And also we're doing, we got a new program this year at the high school for ACT prep where kids can go on anytime and do practice tests or other things like that. So I think in the future years that'll be helpful because I know I didn't have that, but I would have used it if I did. So also, as Mr. Stefano was talking about with attendance with COVID, the high school is going to have March be an attendance month. So Mr. Chanson's going to do like people who have perfect attendance for a week, get prizes to help get kids in school still. So me and him are working to like get some stuff figured out with what might motivate kids to be at school. That's it. Any questions? So we, do you know what the total number was for uh, the spaghetti night? No, I do not. I think we were planning for like a couple hundred at least. I think we were planning for around like 400-ish. But I don't know how many people were there. Over $2,600 were raised. Right. That's what I heard. Awesome. Good. Awesome. Um, yeah, it's difficult when the colleges take away that ACT requirement yeah. to kind of keep kids motivated. So I'm encouraged to see that um, we're coming up with some inventive yeah. ways to keep kids engaged. So I was appreciative. Thank you. Of course. Anything else for Sadie? All right. Quick report, little response. <laughs> thank you. All right, thank you very much. Um, we will move on then to report by operations. Operations committee met on January 24th. Um, one of the big parts was the discussion on ESSER funds, which we just voted on, so I won't go into that. We also um, uh, discussed uh, requests for proposals for spring of 2022. One of them is for food service management and one is for life and health insurance. We will be doing an RFP process for food service that's controlled by the USDA through the DPI. And um, we've contracted with Taher since 2012. Um, usually the contracts are for one year, but they can be extended um, for f uh, four years for a total of five. And so we had extended that with Taher, and then in 2017, we again selected them. And so now it's another five years since then. So we do, we are going to be um, having um, the, R the RFP process and um, in order to get uh, food services to give us uh, their, their quotes and um, to be our food service management company. 
Um, there will, we need two board members who will be reviewing those proposals when they come from the food service. Um, they're to be mid-April returned. So if anybody's interested in being on that particular uh, decision committee to review those uh, proposals, let me know. Um, and we will also, we're looking at uh, proposals for our um, uh, life insurance because EPIC, which we've currently have had for life insurance for employees, has informed us they are no longer going to be in the business of doing life insurance. So we have to look elsewhere. Um, we've asked M3, our uh, current uh, company that we work with in order to take care of our insurance needs to look at options for us. So they're reviewing some things. And we will also be looking, um, we've um, been happy with our health care provider, but we, um, M3 thinks it would be good to look at potential differences in costs. So we will be reviewing that as well. Um, and that we expect the next renewal in mid-February. And um, let's see, the contract for the health insurance would be July 1st of 2022 to start. Our next committee meeting is scheduled for February 28th at 5.30. Any questions for Marge? All right, teaching and learning. Uh, teaching and learning met on January 17th. Our entire um, committee members were present for the meeting. The main focus of our meeting was to discuss the SR funding, which we've already addressed this evening. And then the secondary focus uh, was Mr. Peters providing us a report on the district's at-risk programming, reviewing the definition of at-risk, the continuum of services, the program goals and baselines. He also provided an overview of the diploma options that exist. And we discussed the GED option two, offering a traditional school diploma and preparing students for the HSED assessments. It does require DPI approval and full implementation is targeted for the 2022-2023 school year. Uh, the alternative program competency-based diploma also offer, offers a traditional school diploma, but the transcript is different from the GED option two. Students have limited options after graduation and it would be offered to senior students who do not have any other option for graduating on time. Um, the non Beaverdam Unified School District options are the HSED and the HSAP offered through Moraine Park Technical College. Um, Mr. Peters offered, uh, he reviewed those successes and challenges for the program, the next steps, which include planning for next school year for 2022-2023. Our next committee meeting for teaching and learning is scheduled for February 21st at 5.30. All right, questions for Lisa? All right, <clears throat> general board engagement. I know we had a couple opportunities uh, during this uh, last month to get out and be engaged in some different things. I'd like to give the board an opportunity to share any of those engagements. I um, attended the Washington School tour and then also sat in on the parent advisory and the staff advisory committee meetings. Uh, yeah, John and I did all the same things this month. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> like our reports will be similar. Uh, I was really impressed with a number of things at, at Washington. Just um, it was great to have a real chance to talk to so many of the staff members and to have them be happy with, to visit with us as well and uh, to meet a lot of the, the kids. Uh, one of the things I enjoyed was watching the kids run into school. Granted, it was freezing that morning, so there was no horsing around. They were coming in. Uh, but it was just, it was a great uh, chance to see the first part of their day. And then it's always nice. Um, I just want to thank the parents that take time to be part of that parent advisory team because I've had the chance to sit on that a few times. And um, they're giving a, a part of their pretty valuable morning time to come and sit in on that meeting and, and hear what the district's doing and then to give their opinions. So... Uh, it's really valuable to the district to have that input as well as the staff that gives time at the end of their day to sit in and uh, 
and weigh in and a lot of times represent their colleagues as well uh, with opinions they've been gathering towards some things that we're working on. So thanks to everyone that takes time to uh, participate in those groups. They really help shape the direction of the district. All right, anybody else? I was at the pasta with the purpose and it's just impressive to see the six different groups come together to put that on. I think FFA um, is probably a lead it kind of feels like it at that. I'm not really sure, but um, Mr. Gansky <coughs> just, just does a great job getting that all organized, and it's neat to see all the different groups come together and work. There's a lot of planning and and work at the event. So. And the food is very good. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Anybody else? All right. Um, also in January, we, uh, some of us went to the uh, State Education Convention, and typically the following month, we allow an opportunity for uh, any of the board members who attended the State Education Convention to share um, um, a summary of uh, classes they went to and things they learned. So with that, um, I'll start it off. So um, Two of, the, uh, two of the sessions I went to, uh, one was uh, regarding uh, peer visit teams. And, um, you know, in summarizing what this school district was doing specifically with their peer visit teams was trying to promote this authentic collaboration. And what I really found is interesting in that session was is that this school district through their peer uh, visit teams are doing a majority of what we're doing in our, collabor in our collaboration efforts. So not necessarily did I learn a whole lot, other than what other school districts are doing specific to collaboration, we're right on par with what other districts are doing as well. So that was good to see. Um, also sat in on uh, a session on student involvement. And I know we already have that, but what I was really looking for was um, things that we can do different to modify and increase um, the amount of involvement that we get from student reps. So obviously, uh, Cindy does a per, you know an excellent job on giving us kind of like a summary of student body. Um, but the school district that I went to really goes a lot more in depth as to um, superintendent, principal, and student rep involvement and where that sits with the student council. And they actually go in and will give specific things each each month based on where in the school year you are, like what things typically are talked about based on where you are in the school year. And those questions are given to student council. Student council talks about those, shares that information with the student rep, and the student rep then reports on that information um, in their report to the board. So it just it, it gave, it gave me the opportunity to look at a couple different ways to maybe increase the amount of involvement from a student rep standpoint on the board. So I'll <coughs> look to possibly bring some of those uh, ideas forward as we move on. Anybody else? I, um, <clears throat> I attended del delegate convention, so uh, that went well. It was long. We had some, uh, that was uh, either in person or virtual, so we had some technological problems, so it, <laughs> it started about 1 and probably got done about 4.30 I came at, and uh, uh, everything got passed as they had in the packet. Um, there was one amendment to the special education funding that they were going to ask for the one that, you know, they were, the one of the resolutions was to ask for like a 60% um, pay, up, pay, and that got amended to 90%, so that passed, so we'll see where that goes. Um, and I myself attended a few uh, workshops, and one of them I attended was the Valley of Youth Apprenticeship Program. And I know we have some youth apprenticeship program participants here in Beaver Dam, and they brought in a local industry leader and, and uh, talked about the benefits and how it helps his company and, and helps recruit youth even that might not be interested in that field, but they get in, get in there and start doing something, they see other things, and it spurs other interests, and, and some career paths change. So. Um, so that, that was a really interesting seminar. So, Others? Um, I, well, I attended um, the convention and went through the, to the three general sessions, which I thought were all well done. I, 
I really liked uh, Brandon Fleming, the second uh, second person. And um, like I do all most years, I buy their books and have their autographs on on my books. So I did that again. Um, but it was interesting hearing them and uh, listening to some of their, um, you know, what happened to them in their life where I, where I took them. Um, I, a couple of the sessions that, one of the sessions that was quite interesting was one called Myths About Learning That We Need to Abandon. Mm -hmm. And it's like where you say uh, that, uh, Small classrooms, s smaller class sizes, do they generate better uh, outcomes? And that's a falsehood based on the information that they've really seen. It's, uh, there might be an upper limit to the number of kids in the class that could make a difference on that, but for the most part, it's not that that's the, that it's the teacher quality that becomes the most important part of that for the kids. But um, there were some interesting things. And um, I also went on the education tour. And this year, we went to Discovery World. And um, that was um, kind of interesting to see how they have had to pivot, which seemed to be the operative word for, this, uh, for the convention anyway this year, um, with the COVID and taking care of things like that. and. Um, they have some opportunities there for teachers to um, get some training on certain things to bring to their classrooms. And I'm going to share that later with Rob, some of the information that I had gotten and some of the names. Um, and then they have kits that the kids can work on if they can't get to Milwaukee to go to Discovery World itself they're able to do it in their own classroom with some of these things. So there are some opportunities there. So all in all, I thought it was great that we were able to be in person. Uh, last year's being virtual was a little, especially missing Donald Driver in person was kind of a uh, sorry spot, but um, we were back live again this time, so that was great. Did you see Craig Council? Yeah, I also uh, just had a quick report. I went to um, several sessions, um, a couple of them. One, one was focused on equity, ensuring, and ensuring all students have what they need to succeed. And there's a lot of discussion about that and with regard to success in the classroom. So just some really good information. Um, uh, another one about community engagement and collaboration, and I think we as a district are doing a lot of the things that I heard about in there. So it was a good, it was a good learning experience for me. Anybody else? I attended uh, the same session Marge did about the myths. In fact, I think there might have been two or three of us in that session. <laughs> yeah. Not planned, but it's always nice. I feel like you picked the right ones then. <laughs> um, I also went to a, a number, a couple of them that revolved around mental health, emotional, social learning, and trauma sensitivity, just to see if there was anything new out there. And I think, like you said, Chad, we're not perfect, but when I listen to what is being proposed or what other districts are doing, we're, we're pretty much either there or looking into it. So that's always a, a nice feeling to know that we're keeping up with stuff or ahead of the curve. Anybody else? So I just want to say thank you for this opportunity. It, it was amazing. I was able to go, and I attended many of the sessions. All the ladies and gentlemen kind of went through. Um, my biggest one was one that spoke about physical education with mental health, how our children need to have physical education. And thanks to all the schools that had football, you know, all those, uh, like, the physical education aspects of it, because it's helping all the children with their mental issues, with COVID, with having them to go um, virtual and then coming back. Um, they said that that helped them 
tremendously mentally because they had an outlet to let go and they were able to um, endure more things and they were able to focus more in classes. So I thought that was pretty amazing. Awesome. Anybody else? I just wanted to, for um, Joanne's sake, she wasn't there in <laughs> the three um, uh, parts at the beginning of the sessions where you had the bands and orchestras and things like that perform were amazing. Um, the, there was a group from Chippewa Falls called the Wire Choir. Wow, was that different. And then you missed the handbell one. I heard and, there were handbells there. Yeah, <laughs> and, and that was, the, and uh, the first one was uh, a real high level orchestra, um, you know, ensemble group that was, I, they, and I would like to see sometime that maybe Beaver Dam have uh, a group. We've talked about that at different times, but I think we have a lot of talent here too, that maybe there would be some opportunities there. And we should always look into when they offer the, um, the artwork that mm -hmm. uh, you know, we should watch for the notifications to let um, our people know that they could submit things for, for that mm -hmm. kind of stuff as well. Mm -hmm. nice. All right, anybody else? All right. Um, recognitions. Anybody have any recognitions that they'd like to share? I would then uh, turn it over to Mark. Anything you'd like to add? I will be brief and uh, basically tie off of what Sadie shared. I think our kids um, continue to demonstrate on a regular basis that they give back to our community and that they're willing to um, serve to benefit others. Uh, Pasta with a Purpose was a great example of that, all six of those groups, and then also want to thank uh, the staff that helped put that together and some other people referenced. Uh, Mr. Gansky, I know a lot of hands were in that. So uh, just continue to be really impressed and appreciative, and I think that's definitely a highlight of our, of our district is the amount of giving back our kids do, um, not just in those groups, but even through um, other activities, our sports, uh, as well, um, all of our, our teams and programs uh, are charged with giving back and uh, they do an outstanding job. So continue to be impressed with that. And then uh, I think we're gonna have some other recognitions um, during uh, Dr. White's presentation because we've got a few retirements coming up later. All right, thank you. With that, we will move on to 11. So if I can have a motion to go into close. I move we recess into closed session per Wisconsin Statute 19.85, parent 1, parent C, considering employment, promotion, compensation, or performance evaluation data of any public employee over which the governmental body has jurisdiction or exercises responsibility, specifically to discuss specific employees or employee groups, and Wisconsin Statute 19.85, parent 1, parent E, for deliberating or negotiating the purchasing of public properties, the investing of public funds, or conducting other specified public business whenever competitive or bargaining reasons require a closed session. Um, the board will reconvene into open session for the possible transaction of business and adjournment. I'll second that. All right, motion and a second to go into closed session. A roll call vote, please. John Hall? Yes. 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 All right, we will be back a little bit later. Thank you for coming.
All right, we're good? Yep, all right, we are back in uh, open session and we will move on to uh, 13.1. There are two resignations on the board agenda for tonight. Um, one of them is retiring from the field of education and um, is on the agenda as a resignation because they are not technically retiring from us, but they're retiring from the state of Wisconsin teaching profession. Mm -hmm. And then the other one um, is listed on there as well, E and G. I move the board approve the resignations and retirements as presented. Can I talk about the retirements quick? I'm sorry. Go right ahead, I should have not have paused. Um, <laughs> so we do have uh, five uh, retirements on the agenda as well, um, totaling about 125 years of service to our district, which is remarkable. Um, Leanne Gensch is a special education TA at the middle school. She's been with our district for over 10 years. Jessica Greetens is a special education teacher at the middle school. She's been here for 23 years. Dan Hallman, physical education teacher at Prairie View Elementary School, 32 years. Joy Lahendro, school social worker for our elementary schools, also 32 years. And Kelly Rybrandt, physical education teacher at our high school, and 28 years. Okay, so I'll move again that we'll approve the retirements and the resignations as presented. Second. Second, yes. All right, we have a motion and a second then to approve the resignations, retirements as presented. All in favor, say aye. 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 All those not, same sign. All right. Thank you. And there thank are you two leaves serve. of absence on the agenda for your approval tonight. I move the board approve the leaves of absence as presented. Second. A motion and a second to approve the leave, leaves of absence as presented. All in favor, say aye. 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 All those not, same sign. All right. There are three different appointments on the agenda tonight. Um, one is Ashley Martell for grade seven math and also filling in K through eight. So she's going to kind of be our, to coin, um, what did Mark say earlier? Was this Swiss Army night? She's going to fill in in all different kinds of, yes, Swiss Army of roles for the <laughs> remainder of the year. And then Ashley Probst is grade five teacher for Lincoln Elementary School. That's a long-term sub position. And Angelette Winkle, Spanish teacher at the middle school. I move the board approve the appointments as presented. Second. All right, we have a motion and a second to approve the appointments as presented. Roll call vote, please. Mary Bloom? Yes. Maria Mason? Yes. Lisa Yes. 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 Thank you. Thank you for sticking around. <laughs> All right, 13.4, board policy update. First reading. Sorry, I turned my mic off. Um, pretty excited about this particular board policy um, update slate from Neola, our policy partner, because it is palatable. Uh, if you recall, the last one was mm -hmm. huge. Right, so yeah. we're back to a little bit uh, more of a normal slate. Uh, there are two new policies. Um, being considered for this, so I would ask that you go ahead and review. Uh, one is a criminal history record check and employee self-reporting requirement. The other one is authorization to make electronic fund transfers, uh, which is a little bit more uh, vanilla. Uh, there are also 28 revisions and um, updates uh, that they are recommending uh, to the districts that they serve. And then you will notice that there are two other districts um, under district review. I do not anticipate that we'll be asking that you approve finalized policies of these um, necessarily with the second reading, um, but just want the board to know that we are reviewing uh, these policies, um, specifically uh, policy 5722, school-sponsored publications and productions. Um, it takes some time to work through this process. Neola has provided a toolkit. We'll work through this in the spring, possibly into summer, and then bring it back to the board for consideration um, of, a, of approval. Um, also policy 5410, promotion placement and retention. So we're looking at doing some updates and revisions uh, to those policies. There really isn't too much that's pressing with that necessarily, but it fits into some other context uh, that we have other conversations that we have had at teaching and learning. So that's gonna be part of some teaching and learning conversation. Um, but those are under our review as a district. 
Um, so again, two new policies, 28 revisions and updates from NEOLA. This is your first reading, so let me know if you have any questions. Second reading will come back to you in March. All right, I'm going to move this on to other business and payment of claims. I move the board make payment and claims in the amount of four million six hundred and seventy six thousand four hundred and eighty dollars and five cents. Second. A motion a second then for payment of claims. Can we have a roll call vote, please? Maria Mason? Yes. 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 All right. Look for a motion for adjournment. So moved. Second. Motion, a second for adjournment. All in favor, say aye. 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 All those not, same sign.